We're going to be talking about the anatomy of the foot now. And as a reminder, we've talked about some of these things when we were looking at the lower leg and ankle, but I still think it's good to review them really briefly. The posterior bones of the foot, or we call them the rear or the heel bones, are going to be your tarsals. They're irregular bones, but they're really important and they make up and take on a lot of the stresses that you're going to be impacting or imparting throughout your lower extremity and your foot. The first one is going to be your talus. It's the most superior of those bones. And again, it's the bone that articulates in the talocrural joint. So we have our tibia superiorly and medially, the fibula laterally, and then the talus. And as we move them into plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, we should be able to feel the talus moving underneath our finger. And again, as we go into plantar flexion, it moves anteriorly. And as we move into dorsiflexion, it moves posteriorly. And part of the reason for that is it's shaped a lot like our fist. So posteriorly, it's very skinny and anteriorly, it's really thick. And this affects our ability to do plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. We can go into a much more plantar flexion because that skinny part of the talus can move up into the talocrural joint much better than the wide part. So as we go into dorsiflexion, that wide part of the talus gets jammed up in the joint and it really blocks us from being able to move nearly as far. So the shape of the talus really affects our ability to move our ankles through normal range of motion, or if there's damage to it, it can affect it even more so. So below or inferior to the talus is our calcaneus, which a lot of people call our heel bone. And we've talked about that the joint between the talus and the calcaneus is called our sub -talar joint. So sub means below talus. So you guys should know if we're looking at anatomical structure, Talus sits superior to the calcaneus, so the subtalar joint would be in the middle. And there are some ligaments that lie in the middle of those that we can assess using the subtalar glide test, either medial or lateral. But we'll get into the tests in a little bit. And, and really those are ankle tests, so we'll only talk about those particular ankle tests briefly. From there, as we move more distally in the foot or anteriorly, from the calcaneus and the talus, we have several other talus, ta tarsal bones. Wow, I'm struggling today. So on the medial side, we're going to have the navicular bone. And the navicular bone we talked about is the insertion point for our posterior tibialis. And it's really important in, in isolating that uh, or in as an insertion for that particular bone. And later we'll talk about foot drop and how we look at the navicular tuberosity to be able to measure foot drop. Um, from there, we also have the cuboid, which is very lateral. And that bone is important in just general structure and function of your foot. And then we also have medial to that and anterior to the navicular are our cuneiforms. So we're gonna have the lateral cuneiform, the medial or intermediate cuneiform, and then the medial cuneiform. Each one of these bones is going to line up with our metatarsal bones, which are the long part of your foot. And similar to the hand, the metatarsals and the phalanges are counted one, two, three, four, five, with the halicus or the great toe always being one and the pinky toe being, or digiti minimi, being five as we run across. And so the medial cuneiform lines up with metatarsal one, the intermediate or middle runs into two, three is with the lateral, and then the cuboid lines up with four and five as we go across. We also have where those come together, and if you kind of fold their foot in half, you'll see on the metatarsals and you can kind of feel that there's a ridge where the metatarsals end or they're called the bases of the metatarsals. And as you get into the, the tarsal bones, tarsal bones, metatarsal bones, sorry, that joint is going to be called your tarsal metatarsal joint. And when we talk about Liz Frank injuries, either being sprains or fractures, that is where those injuries occur. So at the tarsal metatarsal joint, and typically when we look at those, we're looking at two and three being injured. Occasionally the fourth gets into that as well, 
but typically two and three. And when we talk about stress fractures in the foot, the second and third metatarsals are also most commonly uh, injured either with stress fractures or fractures. The others aren't nearly as common when we're just talking about general mechanisms. So metatarsals, then this very end part are the metatarsal heads. So think about the ball of your foot. That's where we're really thinking about your metatarsal heads being. And then in that ball of your foot, and I'm gonna use this one and kind of bend and show you guys this way. So this part of your foot, you actually have two bones that are called sesamoids. And they work very similar to your patella. They are not true articulating bones. They are completely encapsulated in your flexor hallucis longus tendon. Sorry, I tickled her. And they're meant to work as pulleys so that way the windlass effect works. So that way when our toe is pushed all the way back into extension while we're walking or running or jumping, that they can take some of the force away so that way we don't have to be as powerful as we're trying to tow off and propel ourselves forward. So those sesamoids are really important. And when we talk about sesamoiditis or fractures of the sesamoids, those are part of this ball of your foot. And that's why this part of our foot, besides that the, the head of our first metatarsal is much bigger, but by having those two sesamoids there, that's why the ball of our foot or this part of our foot is so much bigger than we look at the met heads for the rest of them. And then we get to our phalanges. We have five phalanges and then the phalanxes are the bones that are within them. So there are two in our great toe or our hallucis, just like in our thumb. So we have our proximal and our distal and then all of the rest of your phalanges have three, <laughs> three of them. So you have your proximal and then your middle and your distal for all of them. Even your little bitty pinky toe has three. And so the joints between them, we just have the interphalangeal joint here for the great toe, but we have a proximal and distal interphalangeal joint for all of the other four toes. And then just to kind of bring it all together, our metatarsals meet up with our phalanges. So the joint between the metatarsals and the phalanges is the metatarsal phalangeal joint, also known as the MTP joint, just like the tarsal metatarsal joint is the TMT joint, tarsal metatarsal joint. And please remember if we're talking about joints in the foot, so for instance, if I'm here, this is not the joint. That is the metatarsal head. The joints are where there are spaces in between the bones. So one of the ways that you can do that is if say you pull up on a toe, you should be able to feel a space between the metatarsal and the proximal phalanx as you do that or in the foot as you're going to be verifying, am I on the first metatarsal or am I on that medial cuneiform? you can hold on to the foot and do a mobilization to be able to identify where that motion is occurring. So if I'm here, no motion should occur, no motion should occur. Oh, hey, motion occurs. And so that way you know that you're actually in that joint. So a joint motion should be possible, always possible. And in all the joints that are in the foot, that is something that you should be looking for. Uh, as you're doing that kind of stuff. And again, just as a reminder, when we talk about foot motion and ankle motion, the lateral malleolus that comes off of your fibula hangs lower than your medial malleolus, which is why when we talk about injuries, we're able to invert far more than we're able to evert. And also that's why those inversion injuries like the ATF and CF injuries happen far more frequently than our eversion injuries, which is when we're talking about deltoid injuries or distal fibular fractures.